Hello, everybody. Welcome to our channel, Scientology Peeling the Onion. My name is Mark Fisher, and I'm here with my co-host, Janice Gillum-Grady. How are you doing today, Janice? G'day, everybody. I'm doing good, Mark. You? I'm good. I'm good. We've got a great guest here for us. Why don't you go ahead and uh, yeah, tell everybody a little do. bit about him? Yeah. Yeah. This guest, I've known him since 1970 when he arrived at the ship in a sinking boat. And he's going to tell that story. <laughs> But um, yeah, he, since 1970, he was on the Apollo with me. And then when we moved to Florida, he was in Dunedin with us and LRH, L. Ron Hubbard. And then he was also with all of us in La Quinta and again at Gilman Hot Springs, the gold base. So he's got a long history, lots of incredible stories. And um, yeah, let's just get on with it. And in, I'm going to introduce Stuart Moreau. Hi, Stuart. Hey, How are you doing? How do you do? My name is Stu. <laughs> Jan, told me, Jan told me to lead with that because that's uh, that's generally how I greet people. You know, put a lot of hands yes. in so you, so you don't. That's, that's, a great, that's a great way to greet people, that's for sure. <laughs> well, you know, I, like, I liked it too when he did it with me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, from big league sales closing techniques. You know, you put a little tag at yeah. the end so they don't forget you. Mm -hmm. That stuff's well, and they won't forget you. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're yeah. uh, on. Now. Well, well, I was just going to say yep. we wanted to Janice. You introduced him, and uh, we just want to start out and introduce you to our viewers, Stuart. Uh, tell people, how, you know, how did you get into Scientology? You know, where where did it all begin for you? Okay, I'll do that. But I just want to do a real brief. Um, little blurb at the beginning of this and okay. say that, that I am pro Scientology. All right. Okay. I'm here because uh, I want to make sure that people who are interested in Scientology, like new people, understand we got a lot of old timers and probably a lot of those guys know me. But for new people, um, I um, <clears throat> Scientology was very good for me. I learned a lot and I and what gains that I did uh, achieve in Scientology has have stuck with me for well since I got in in 68 it's like over 50 years and um, I want to make sure that new people understand that you're hearing a lot of stories about really an advanced part of Scientology and missing a, a whole bunch of stuff if you're just trying to make sense of it from here and um, it's it's if you want to find out what Scientology is really about you really should go to an organization, to a Scientology church, and um, and just find out, it, it, you know, take the dive and, uh, and and find out what it's really about. I don't want you to get scared off by the wild stories you hear on these kind of sites. Um, and Scientology has set a very high standard for me as uh, in uh, uh, to compare to other religions and philosophy things that I have studied before and since. So this is a um, basically why i want to get at where I, what I, the message that i wanted to relay here um there's okay okay yeah, yeah. Okay. all right so That'll like i fine. said like what just so our viewers know we we have no agenda here uh, pro or con we believe that people have the freedom to believe how they want to believe whatever they want to believe some people believe in scientology that's totally within their right and they got tremendous gains and wins from it i got a lot of gains and wins from it I, we've talked about it on our channel but i also know too that there are also negative things that happen in scientology and we've talked about those as well and so we hope that people will go in with an open mind and and hear all the sides of the story and then decide for themselves that's that's really what anything you do whether it's Scientology or getting your teeth pulled or operation from your doctor. I mean, you want to get all the information and that's why we're providing this. That's, that's a very good attitude because um, Scientology is a, a, can be a life. Uh, well, for me, it was, you'll see in my little, how I found out about it story. It could be looked at as a lifesaver in my case. And, uh, you know, I got into uh, uh, my background is I grew up in San Francisco in the sixties when all the um well the hate ashbury stuff was going on and the the, uh, the hippie movement took uh, started there the whole um peace and love summer and, of love summer yeah, of love well, yeah that was just a part of it but it had been going on for yeah. years and everybody uh -huh. wanted to go to san francisco then and get and go to the hate ashbury but i find these days um very few people actually know they go i say hate ashbury they go huh and it's like 
it was such a big deal back then. We had a, a, a it's a neighborhood in San Francisco near Golden Gate Park, which is a, a beautiful 15 block long park in San Francisco. There you go. I got it right yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. See there, that's the Haight Ashbury there. And, and right down the block is the Golden Gate Park. And then you can go ahead and, uh, well, I'll see. Yeah. Put the next one up. See, okay. I have number one over on the lower right. That's where I lived. And the high school I went to was at number three. So, and I walked to school most of the time, or I took a bus, and you couldn't go through that mountain there. San Francisco's all hills and really hills and mountains. Are, yeah. So, I so used, you went to school uphill both ways? No, no, I had, I had to walk around and go down Haight Street to get to, well, I went to, what did you say? No, it's usually a joke about how old people went to school, you know, in the snow, had to hide. Oh, up here yeah. both ways yeah. to get to school. It was, uh, it was a bit of a walk, but you know, I didn't, I didn't notice it. I had my choice of high schools, and I picked that one, which was a, it was a pretty, pretty rough school. It was probably um, sixty-five percent uh, black at the time, and uh, that was because the hate used to be a uh, hate Ashbury, used to be a working-class uh, black neighborhood, and there was neighborhoods back then. Uh, you know, that was in the days, that was one of the reasons that the whole peace and love movement started is the whole peace and love movement started was because young people were getting fed up with the, uh, well, there was a lot of problems going on back then. You don't mind if I talk about all this stuff. No, no, no. The Vietnam War, you had uh, uh, civil rights movement. Yeah, we had the Vietnam War yeah. going on. There was, there was race riots. Parts of cities were being burned down. The Cuban Missile Crisis was only a few years before, and that was very close to uh, nuclear war. It was pretty, uh, it was pretty hairy. And the young people, the whole baby boomers, the people born after uh, World War II, were just kind of fed up with it and wanted to do things differently. And that right. that whole uh, um, counterculture rose out of that whole feeling that was going on then. And so I was right in the middle of all that stuff going on. It was, it was, uh, that's a whole story in itself. I mean, I'd be riding a bus down, down Haight Street in the early days. And um, Haight, by the way, is H-A-I-G-H-T. That was a uh, well-known banker in California. They named that street after him. And Ashbury was just a cross street. The neighborhood's called the Haight Ashbury. And my school was at number three there. Right. right. Okay, and then uh, the Golden Gate Park was number four. I think I mentioned that already. Um, yeah. So you actually grew what? up in Haight Ashbury. I mean, are the other people we've interviewed, I think they just kind of were in Berkeley and migrated or Santa Cruz or whatever, right? Yeah. But you were really well, that's right what happened. Is, that's, is, that was your neighborhood, right? <laughs> everybody in the country wanted to go to San Francisco, to, to the Haight Ashbury back then. And, and believe me, the few years, the, lead, the couple of years leading up to the summer of love, it was like a tourist attraction. Everybody was coming to gawk at the hippies. And it was actually a pretty cool place. You know, the newer bands like the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane, they uh, used to do, uh, they would just do impromptu concerts in the park and, you know, mm -hmm. we'd just roll up. It was a really, I mean, in retrospect, a pretty cool place to, to grow up. But that's Steve. where all that went on. So that, you know, everybody, all these alternative uh, ways of thinking were represented there. So you're talking about, I got exposed to like the Hare Krishnas, the, um, the Maharishi Yogi, the, uh, the uh, you are what you can eat people, all these different meditating people and the, uh, the Buddhists and the Islams and the, the uh, Christians, they were all there in full force. I mean, it was, so I was exposed to all that. The, uh, the uh, Tao, the Tao Te Ching, you know, the, the way uh, and, and Confucius, and I read all that uh, stuff, and it influenced me greatly. When I was going to high school, I was a math science major with a focus on uh, electronics and magnetism. It was the, you know, I really thought that was a cool way to go. And um, but the influence of the uh, Haight Ashbury and that whole peace and love movement made me. Uh, when I started college at 18, I changed my major to. Um, uh, the more humanities, like man's relation to man. I really wanted to do something about the planet. I already had it in me that I wanted to help change 
man from this warlike creature to, you know, the peace and love stuff. And right. uh, so I already had that in me. And then um, uh, I just, so I did, I started college and I, and I, I only, and very quickly, it's kind of funny. Sometimes when you put it out there that you're looking for the path, it just kind of falls in your lap. And so me and my, uh, uh, my buddy and I, uh, Charlie, and he, I was kind of a little bit, I would say, um, I grew up on the rough side of the streets in San Francisco. I mean, I got in plenty of fist fights when I was a youngster and, um, and I wasn't a wild and crazy kid. It was just what you did on that sort of, uh, the bad side of the street kind of, I didn't have a lot of guidance from my parents. I got divorced when I was two and uh we lived with my mom and it was overwhelming for her four kids she got kind of sick we had a movement with my dad but my friend charlie he had kind of the opposite uh of uh -huh. he had uh, um doting parents he had a, a lot of good guidance he was a uh, very bright and a cheerful guy uh, an outgoing personality he even had a uh a 63 impala with a with a um convertible top back then which was pretty cool for for uh you know most of my friends drove cars from the city if they had a car so but this is part of the story of this life-saving uh, event of scientology we were walking down right at hated ashbury there and there's a a fellow um selling the um field staff member magazine for 25 cents that one with the picture elevation like this you know yeah yeah, yeah i know the picture yeah. And, uh, and Charlie says, hey, Stu, I heard about that Scientology stuff. Sounded pretty neat. And uh, let's check it out. So I said, oh, okay. And uh, so we both bought a mag, and then we wandered off on our own ways. And I read the whole thing, and it covered, well, first off, one of the things it said was that Hubbard had studied all these different religions and philosophies and, and uh, uh, combined it with a modern scientific approach and came up with, with Scientology and, and Dianetics. And I said, hmm, you know. Cause that's what I was going to college to do. And I said, well, maybe I can save a little time. This guy's already done that. Right. <laughs> uh -huh. And also we had, you know, back then, of course, everybody's wondering what's the purpose of life. What are we doing here? What's the meaning of things? And right off the bat, he says in there, well, the purpose of life is to survive. And I go, Oh, kind of simple. And it makes sense, you know, and then there's a bunch of different ways that you survive. And um, I'd actually like to go over that, but maybe we could save that for a little later. Yeah. We'll save it for later. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. Keep going. All right. So um, what happened with me then is I, I followed up on that. I went down to the Scientology place. It was at, I think it was 515 Mason Street back then. Uh -huh. and, uh, um, I just rolled in there. They didn't have heavy reg lines going on back then. I mean, they had no, no. no follow-up. The guy didn't take my name down or nothing. And I, uh, I just rolled in there and I said, hey, uh, I want to find out a little more about this stuff. And uh, I attended a, a beginning lecture, which was – went over the same kind of stuff and a few other cool Scientology tidbits. And, and I finished the lecture and I, it was, uh, and I, I, I said, wow, I want to, I want to find out a little bit more about this. Well, uh, how do I do that? And they sold me Dianetics, the modern science of mental health, which was the first book that Hubbard wrote. Uh, you guys, right. You'll ask me if I need to clarify something, right? <laughs> oh, you're good. You're good right now. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, I read the book. I, you know, it took me a couple of weeks probably. And, and, uh, uh, and then I think to myself, well, they have in there the, the state of clear, right? It describes how you go through and you become, and I already knew, I mean, it was kind of out there that you were only using about 10% of your mind and 90% was unconscious. So that, it all kind of made sense to me. And I was certainly interested in unlocking all that 90%. And, uh, -huh. uh, I, uh, um, and there's also described in the book, the state of clear, which was when you're cause over this un unconscious mind and the, uh, before that the person was called a pre-clear. So I said, mm, I want to find me one of these pre-clears. Now I don't know anything. Right? I just read the book. I'm thinking, where can I find a pre-clear? <laughs> I swear to God. And, uh, um, I'm thinking, well, my friends are all, you know, they're smoking wheat and stuff like that. And, um, I, thought, I don't know. It'd be too much to group them in. I said, hmm, maybe I'll go down to that Scientology place and see if I can find uh -huh. a pre-clear. So I roll in there and say, hey, I wanna, I'm looking for a pre-clear to do some of this Ajinat. 
and they and so they signed me up for the uh the communications course back then right. it was 15 bucks okay and wow course, i think i paid 50 when i went into 1973 but yeah no it was, it was relatively inexpensive yeah it was this uh, was this was 1968 okay all right i was 18 i, I just started college my first semester of college and um uh that was exactly what I needed. That comp course just blew me away. I was like, uh, well, you know what it is, it, it does, it breaks down communication. And I mean, they should teach that kind of stuff in high school, you know, so you learn how to communicate. Yeah, I, I blew me away too. I mean, literally I was four, uh, 15 years old when I did it and it changed the way that I communicated with people. I tell people all the time on this channel, I couldn't do this, this show right now. Literally, if I had never done the communications course or gotten some of my lower Scientology auditing, like my communicate, you know, level zero, grade zero and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, go ahead. I, 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 the communications course to me, we've talked about it, Janice and I, that yeah. you know, that, would, that should be something that Scientology should be delivering everywhere, yeah. whether it was Scientology or just as an external thing, because it really does help people. Now, see, one of the things about going to a, a majority black high school, Back then, we had this stuff called uh, rap. Before rap music came out, rapping meant just having a smooth way of talking. Yeah, he's got, that, a, he's got a cool rap. Yeah, yeah go rap I noticed, go. I noticed yeah. that the, the guys that could pick up the girls or could deal with the women had a good rap. Now, I didn't have a good rap, you know. They and call it game. He's got I'm good game, too. too. That's yeah, another one, game. <laughs> yeah, which, yeah, so if I had done the course when I was 15 and started high school it could have gone a lot better for me yeah you know I mean girls had to tell me what to do they, they uh but it was I mean anyway you know typical guy very interested in the female as a species um anyway so that course just just blew me away and uh and I'm walking out of there thinking man I want to tell the world about this and of course they signed me up to be a field staff member you know and uh tell what tell everybody what, what field staff member is well a field staff member is you can make money selling scientology to people that aren't in scientology you can it's called disseminating and you can go out and uh you can explain to somebody then if you tell them to go in you select them you write a little slip and they go down and and then scientology would pay you a 10 or 15 percent commission 10 percent for uh courses and 15 percent for uh, auditing I know it's the other way around, I think. But um, <clears throat> people make a living being field staff members by regular right. people. In fact, if you do go into Scientology from here, just tell them. Here's another little rhyme for you. Tell them Stu sent you, <laughs> 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 and and, he, and you can tell them that um, you can tell them that Stu said that you can apply his commission to your to a discount on your services how's that for a deal i don't need well that. there you go <laughs> i'm all well set up and uh, i'm uh, i'm retired and uh, i kind of do what i want to do these days yeah that's why i'm back here by the way is i've got well the kids are all gone i got no dogs i got no wife after the second divorce which is okay everything's all right yeah, uh, you know, I I have no house anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm renting, you know, or other uh, things like that, which is fine. But I got no commitments basically, and I think, what do I want to do? Well, I would li really like to help on my purpose of helping people, uh, helping the planet get better. And and this, in a way, is doing that. You know, if you get into Scientology or just feel better about Scientology by being here, or just feel better about your relations with your fellow man. Uh, that would well, be, you know, Stuart, you know, you're, you're, you're explaining the exact same thing that happened to me. Now, Janice is different because she was born in yeah, she was, Scientology, she, right? But I wasn't, my dad was in the Navy and he got out, he was, he retired and I was 14 years old and he, he read the Dianetics book, went into the Washington DC organization, you know, got training and auditing and thought, this is really life changing. Yeah. And then he said, Mark, you know, I'd like you to come and try it. And I yeah. did. And I got dead. I, I was like, this is fantastic. I mean, literally, I, I'm just trying to explain to our viewers that people go like, well, how could you ever get involved in something like that? Because it was it fantastic did. at the time. <laughs> yeah. It was different. And then and then it's very, all you know, I, ha I wanted to change the world just like you did. I'm oh, yeah. 
16, 17, rather than going to college? No, I want to go work for L. Ron Hubbard because they do great things, you know? And I'm sure it was the same for you too, right? Okay. It becomes a calling. A calling is yeah. a religious a feeling that you just feel like you have to do this. And um, you just know it's it's a good thing to do. And uh, that's that's what happened with me. It's like, yeah, this is what Yeah, I'm and then also I just want to say to, on Janice's side of things, oh, I, yeah. I've met, I met both of her parents, okay? Peter Gillum was a legend when it came to disseminating yeah. and getting people in Scientology and helping them through yeah. vitamins and nutrition and just, you know, all that sort of stuff and started groups in Australia and all over the place. And then, of course, Yvonne, Yvonne Gillum, you know, she, she did the same thing in Australia and then was, you know, on the ship in the Sea Org and then eventually started Celebrity Center. And they were they were amazing people. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it wasn't like they were negative, like they didn't think that they were getting somebody into something that was going to be destructive yeah. or was going to yeah. hurt people. Yeah. You know what I mean? No. Well, and you know, growing up with them, I grew up with a mission, a Scientology mission in our house. So if I go, I come home from school and, you know, there's people in the living room, you know, doing their, standing the ashtray up in the chair or practicing their commands on a doll. And, you know, so, and I saw a difference in people from when they would first come in to when they finished, you know, and. So I did see that, and I've even wondered myself, how would I be if I had never had this yeah. experience? Who would I be? I think I have to be an example of what Scientology was all about, yeah. because that's what I was raised with. That's what was ingrained into my head is all Scientology from birth, you know? Well, and Janice, and you've turned into a very, you've been very successful, I mean, you know, throughout your life, in your career in Scientology, you were very successful. And then since leaving Scientology, just not even just with your husband, just with your kids and everything, you know, so you're right. definitely a credit to your family and to yourself, you know. Anyway, sorry, Stu. We got well, when, I, when I started this, I actually wanted to um, make this kind of a tribute to uh, uh, Yvonne and uh, Jan, actually, because... Yvonne, uh, she was. Do you want to put the wedding stuff up now or do that later? No, we'll do I that later. I didn't, <laughs> yeah, I didn't get yeah, those. Well, we can go over all that later. But she was the yeah. epitome of, of greatness. There's a, a, a essay uh, L. Ron Hubbard wrote on uh, what is greatness, and I'm just well, I won't read those lines right now. But basically, uh, it's it, the what is greatness uh, is something L. R. H. wrote about how. Um, it has all about love and forgiveness and inclusion, see, which is important. And he, he said that, uh, uh, you know, to love in spite of it all, you, you know, basically loving somebody despite all the reasons you shouldn't uh, may very well be the greatest secret in the universe. And Yvonne was really the epitome of that. She was a very, very uh, achieving person. She achieved so much in Scientology and for Scientology. And with all that going on, whenever you were around her, you just felt very special. She just had that glow about her. Yeah, and she had a warmth, and she we called it in Scientology when I was in, Grant. she granted you beingness. In other exactly. words, she, she accepted you into her space, and you felt right. welcome there, whether you knew her or not, right? Yeah. yeah. That is... Uh, and, to that is a the right anyway sorry you got a little distracted. anyway so anyway so you got in you did the communications course yeah and became a field i got staff in member. and uh, and, and then, then i how, did how, go ahead go ahead carry on well i i uh, um i was still in college at that time and i was i was working some to to pay my way because I, I had a falling out with my dad so i was on my own and um <clears throat> uh, i had some well, I did a little bit of auditing at that time and had some pretty good wins. But this is an example of how, um, well, I, I'll, I'll go over that later because it's not a, uh, anyway, I did some auditing. But what I decided to do, and one of the things I was going to do as a job was I was going to try and sell colliers, colliers encyclopedias door to door. So <laughs> I went through their little training program. I did a little bit of, in the field work. And um, I just couldn't bring myself. I had a sort of a, a, a a strong sense of uh, integrity and and uh, I just couldn't bring myself to push these people into buying something they didn't really need 
But then what I decided to do was sell Scientology books door to door. And, and this is an, an interesting point about how the, uh, the bad press Scientology. It's almost like it's part of God's plan for Scientology to uh, become well known fast because, you know, what sells is a scandal. And Scientology is on everybody's mind all the time because of all the scandals in Scientology. I have a pretty cool uh, thing. About but anyway, um, uh, I was selling Scientology door to door and people would, I, would, I had a spiel worked out. And um, the first line was, um, have you heard about Scientology? And most people would say, yeah, I read about it in Life magazine. Now, if you remember Life, if you're old enough to remember Life back in 68, that was like yep. something going viral on the internet these days. Everybody exactly. read Life magazine. And Scientology had a, I don't even remember, they're all the same, all these negative stories about all these things that are so-and-so did or got happened to them in Scientology. But that's what people would say, yeah, I read about it in Life magazine. And then I would say, well, would you like to find out what it's really about? And they'd say, yeah. And then I'd do my whole thing and I'd sell them a book. And by selling 200 books, I got awarded the uh, uh, Dianetics course. Back then they had a course come out called Hubbard Standard Dianetics course. Right. Dianetics was written in 1950. And then he quickly um, found that by using the Dianetics techniques on people, which were mainly aimed at body uh, aches and pains and things like that and attitudes, people were having spiritual experiences. And so he realized that his true calling was to develop that whole line and, and, and uncover this, this spiritual uh, beingness of, of people and, and quickly. And it happened really fast. And, and he developed a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of stuff early on. But as the time rolled on, so he had all this Scientology experience, which is strictly mostly dealing with the spirit of man rather than the mind of man. And uh, he applied that to the original Dianetics and came out with this standard procedure called the routine R, R3R, R, which was right. a modern version of Dianetic auditing. And that stuff was really powerful. It, this is, again, a, 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 I guess a serendipity the right word. It was a good time for me to get in Scientology because that they were pushing the, the standard Dianetics course. And right. uh, I got on that course, and um, uh, so I learned how to audit and stuff like that. And during so that, yeah, so just so, so people know, it was Dianetics auditing. You were becoming a processor where you would process somebody else to help handle their problems and situations, right? right? And audit so you is, finally it, found your pre, pre your PC. Your pre clear. <laughs> well, an auditor and and what did, yeah my pre clear. <laughs> now, an, an auditor in Scientology it's it's sort of like a little bit of a an odd word but there's a couple of definitions of of auditor. An auditor is somebody that is really uh, good at looking at business books and and figuring out you know if they make sense like uh, you know income and stuff like that. And another kind of auditor is a person that sits in on a class but is not especially a person that is attending that class they just sit right. in on it like usually at a higher level of learning and so that would be like a professional listener in that case and a, a scientology auditor is more like that and really just a very highly trained listener and becomes more like a spiritual guide right through the uh, guiding you through the things that block your path to your uh spiritual powers in your right. unconscious uh, right Right. Anyway, yeah, so I, I was uh, being trained as an auditor. And I got to tell you, you talk about wins. I had a couple of really, I had some good wins myself, which I'll explain in a couple of minutes. But I was doing auditing on people. And I'm 18 years old, and I just read this stuff. And that course was tough. You had to go through it three times. They had to date them back then because it was being mostly promoted to newer people. So they, they right. said you had, to, you had to do, it was a three times through course. And the datum was number of times through the material equals certain certainty and results. And so you had to do that thing three times and expect you to do that in, in a, like two weeks, right? So I'm putting in the time. <laughs> I wasn't a seer member yet, but staying up late and working hard. Working hard is my forte. That's why I was such a good seer member. I don't have any other real talents, but I could work my ass off. I, I can vouch for that. Yeah. Stu is a hard worker. <laughs> I had a choice in going on libs and working. I often chose working <laughs> by my own. They, you know, this thing about people not getting time off and stuff. 
I don't know. When I was on the ship, you had pretty regular lives, and it wasn't that hard. Liberty, you know, going going. Yeah, Liberty. Uh, it was once every two weeks, and uh, you know, I I got pretty regular time off. But um, so I was the first one there to finish the course, and and uh, I was auditing for the org. But I had this one kid come in, who had uh, the day before almost died because he had severe asthma, and he had been dirt biking. He did have his inhaler with him. And so he was caught in the forest and he, he almost died. And I started doing the processing on him, the processes on him. And he's recalling these incidents and going through this whole thing and just having, and within, I don't know, whatever it is, an hour or something like that, he's, he's taking these deep breaths. He looks at me, he goes, my whole life, I've never been able to take a deep breath. You know, I mean, for him, wow. it, was, yeah, it was miraculous. And, and this is the thing is these kind of things were routine in Scientology. And uh, they can't say they cure stuff because it's against the law to the rules to say, but they do cure things. They fix uh, mental and, and physical things like that. That would be called a psychosomatic illness, which would be a, an illness held in place or induced by the mind. Um, psych meaning mind and somatic meaning uh, feeling. Um, and then I had another guy, and this is a big deal these days. You hear about it all the time on the air. He had erectile dysfunction, okay, <laughs> ED. <laughs> and, you know, this is back in the 60s. I'm 18 years old. That is the furthest thing from my mind. <laughs> but uh, he had situations, and uh, he comes in, and I'm running the processes on him. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. And, and we're going through it. And I, I didn't even tell you the truth. I didn't notice any spectacular things going on. But I tell you what, a couple of days later, I, I met him at a, a gathering, he nudges me and he goes, hey, Stu, it's working now. And I said, way to go. At least he didn't it show you. Yeah. Huh? Well, At least he didn't is. show you. Well, it does. You know, especially these days, I feel that, like, with the older generation, uh, there's so many spouses that are, uh, uh, that are dying. And then, the, the you know, you're with somebody your whole life, your spouse dies. It's a hell of a loss. And Scientology and Dianetics is great. I mean, I still I hope they're still doing those Dianetic Guardian Assist things. But um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because those are just spectacular. Where you you basically run out the incident, and uh, in this case, a severe loss like that is devastating to people. You get, uh, I mean, when you have somebody that you feel that close to that you you've been with your whole life, and then they die, it's like yeah. devastating. But Scientology. Yeah, tell Tell me about it. There you go. Yeah. You know, uh, but see, you're when you get strong enough, you can handle that stuff. But you know, yeah. the, the, it's, the still, it's still it's hard to deal with. Yeah, it's still hard yeah. to deal with, and it's nice with the Scientology audience. That stuff just goes away quickly. And um, but I had a good win too. I had a, my. I was the first one to finish that course, and they they asked me to uh, join staff. And I said, uh, I had already decided I was going to join the Sea Org. Nobody recruited me. I saw a poster up on the wall there with the, probably a couple of women in their Sea Org uniforms and explaining how this is the most dedicated uh, group of Scientology in the planet. And uh, they're working to clear the planet. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm thinking, oh, that, you know, working hard and stuff. And, I said, no, that sounds like my kind of place. So <laughs> I decided I was going to join the Sea Org after I finished the course. And, uh -huh. But they, they said they needed to – I said, okay, I'll work for you guys for a month, then I'm going to go join the Sea Org. And during that auditing time, I started – I had a lot of allergies when I was young. And um, they started showing up when I was in session because one of my triggers was, was uh, like over-focus and stress. When I was, and when I'm auditing public – I started, my nose started running and the Dianetics you're supposed to be able to get rid of all that kind of stuff. And uh, it was basically an allergic reaction. I did have allergies the whole time I was growing up. I would get triggered by uh, cats and dust and stress. When I was doing my um, SATs in high school, my nose was running like a water faucet. I wasn't sick or nothing. It's just the stress was, you know, the intensity and all that. And right. uh, so I got my twin, uh, who was the guy named Bob Lawford. And, and by the way, back then at the org, Dave Foster was somewhere up in the executive level there, and Kathy O'Gorman was somewhere in Div Six. Reset. You know, you guys know Kathy O'Gorman. Sure. Right? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah Kathy was. Uh, she was became the guardian's office at for San Francisco. In, in Flag, in, in Clearwater. Yeah. And also in Clearwater. 
but in, in 60 years, yeah, she was pretty, she had just, she was just used to glow and had the, she was very attractive, uh, you know, one of the, yeah. the, the women in Scientology developed this, uh, this sureness and this uh, certainty and uh, just have a glow about them. It's a very attractive quality. Well, and then Stuart, we've, yeah. we've also <laughs> talked about, yeah, we've also talked about too, Stuart, that there was no, um, you know, there was no discrimination against oh. women in Scientology or the C organization. If you could do the job, they didn't you matter if you were male or female, yeah. you got the job. And you know, from being in the Sea Org, that a lot of the L. Ron Hubbard's top aides yeah. were, were women. You know what I mean? Jill, That's Jill. The, exactly right. Yeah. Hubbard was very advanced. Hannah Altringham, you know what I mean? Oh, People yeah. like Hannah, that. I got a story about Hannah on the boulevard. Man. Oh, well, then you should tell it when we get to the book. <laughs> I'll but, tell you that. But, uh, but I wanted to mention Dave Foster, because you bring up his name. Yeah. There are people who watch us and would wonder what happened to Dave Foster. And apparently, according to you, he is still at the in Clearwater. Oh, yeah. I, was, at the... I actually went to um, Flag a couple months ago. I just rolled in there and, you know, because I'm not, I have people that I consider well, they're, everybody's my spiritual buddy when I meet them. That's my thing. Like, I really like to make a spiritual connection with people. And in Scientology, you, you do that, like, naturally. And um, <clears throat> since I've been, I've been kind of neutral for uh, all the time I've been out. I've been seeing what's going on and keeping an eye on things. And I have my opinion on how to fix the problems that are associated with Scientology still, which I'm happy to consult with if they want to call me up but um yeah dave is uh, uh he's 90 something i wish i got a picture of him i think i sent you a picture of fred Harris. Harris. you sent me one of fred yeah. harris yes but i saw fred and i saw uh, uh dave and uh i uh they didn't put any heavy regin on me. I think that heavy regin has been slowed down. I don't think it's. Are a you thing saying that... Dave Foster at ninety is still a registrar? Yes. Flag? Yes. Wow, that's amazing. That's he, amazing. He was, as far as I know, he was recruited by LRH when he he was at the ship for FEBC or something like that, a high level uh, executive training, and right. LRH wanted him. He specifically, uh, and 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 uh, Dave and Harry had been in the Sea Org. Harry is still she's doing well too. I didn't meet her, but. Dave's uh, he quit smoking them cigars long ago. He started running. He got he got he got very healthy, and he's uh, that's a big key to to longevity is this is uh, exercise. And um, yeah, he's got the same old bright blue eyes and bright smile, and you know he worked on yeah. me a little bit. But uh, he used to be white haired. Is he still white haired? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, he got all of his hair. Probably is. He was white haired when I met him. In 1976. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's got all that hair, and he's, but he's still the same old Dave. You know, he's a little, a uh, little beat up by time, but he's, he's mostly, he's right there mentally. He doesn't miss a beat. I mentioned that. Good. Uh, I mentioned that uh, um, introductory lecture, and, and he remembered the guys. He goes, "Oh yeah, Rick, so and so. He was great." And I said, "Man, you know, <laughs> how did you remember that?" But uh, um, okay, so so you were going to join the Sea Org. Let's get back to right, that. And then so I was auditing, and then my nose was running and stuff. So I said, I said, hey Bob, I gotta I gotta get this handled, man. I can't be sitting here having my nose running and doing this guy named auditing on people. So um, he got a a, a type of um, of a program that's called a Dynetic Auditing Assist, which lists all the pains and sensations that are associated with whatever thing you want to handle. And in right. this case, I had things like runny eyes and runny nose and a few little aches and pains and things like that. And I mean, this is how sci how auditing actually works. OK, so we go in there and does everybody know about the e-meter already or not? Yes. Yeah. OK, the e-meter is actually very, very simple. It's just a uh, it's a meter that can measure differences in the resistance of different things like glass has got uh infinite resistance because it allows no electricity through whereas a piece of copper i mean i have electronics background so it was very easy for me to figure that out i mean it, right. is, it is explained in scientology but people like to think it's mysterious especially the uh outsiders but uh, uh, like something like copper has no resistance and lets electricity flow freely and the body has resistance somewhere in between there and things and hubbard early on wanted to find out if um, the 
mental problems that you were having, like let's say a dog died, your dog died, and you feel like crap, and you're all weighed down and stuff like that. If that would show up on the meter, and, he, and yeah, it turns out it did. And then if you feel really, really good about something, like you just got a raise and your your girlfriend's being really nice to you and stuff like that, and you're walking on here, that shows up on that meter a different way because actually the, the the little bit of mental mass tends to impinge on the body. And it worked. And it was very fortuitous for Scientology because it added a validation to the whole phenomena of getting rid of what was mentally bothering you. Okay. Yeah, and just for our, let me just, just just for our viewers, okay, to give you something maybe you can relate to is when you like when you're upset about something, you can feel a heaviness sometimes in your body. It it doesn't you can't even be like a headache. It feels like God, I'm feeling you know I got this heaviness around me or whatever. And then and then when that when you resolve whatever that situation or problem was poof it's gone right it's not there anymore and that's kind of that's if you can relate to that that's really what it, it's like when you're getting auditing where yeah. you're getting rid of these things and i'm not talking about the the ot level stuff i'm just talking about just it has a heaviness like when you lose somebody you're you're really upset there's an emotional heaviness and then and then it just gets released and you no longer have that Am I right, Stuart? Right. Exactly right. It's it's perfect. And you know, you all you train Scientology people know all this already. It's just anyway. I don't have any beefs with Scientology. It's uh, it was very very good for me. So um, anyway, on the meter uh, is used to find what is most available to to run out. Because remember, I had a lot of these different things going on. But the first thing we ran out was this. Uh, you know, I would probably it starts off with in present time and moves back to earlier and earlier, and then you find what's what's kind of holding that all in place, and it's always something unconscious that you're not aware of, and that's what the auditor helps you un, uh, find. So uh, we uncovered this incident when I was three or four, which, you know, if I really tried, I it was there because I wasn't unconscious, but it was a it was a time that uh, I was in uh, living with my mom. And the neighbors uh, had uh, the neighbor's cat had kittens, and they said, "Oh, you could have one of them." And I'm what three or four years old. I don't know any different. So I take the cat, and I'm all, "Ooh, nice cat," and everything, my little kitty. And and uh, the problem was, I I had it in bed with me at night under the covers, and so I woke up in the morning, and it's stiff as a board, right? Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was this. I mean, you can imagine. That's rough. That's crying rough. my eyes out. I feel horrible, and this stuff's all going on. Now, I remember I said I had this uh, cat out. The uh, cat here was, was one of the triggers, right? And uh, um, so we ran that through a couple of times and found kind of what was holding that in place, which is always something behind that. Uh, those That's a call the moment of uh, loss, you know, a real or imagined loss. Uh, and it affects people, like I was talking about with the older people as their uh, spouses start dying and stuff like that. Uh, and so that was relieved and, and a whole bunch of other things, which I won't, that was the main thing that's kind of like very, very obvious. But um, so that was in 1968. So we're here and I had a bad allergy problem. So we're here um, 56, 56 years, later. years later and I have not had an allergy problem since then. That's okay? great. Now, when I tell uh, my friends about that, maybe they say something like, why don't you just take a pill? Who wants to take a pill for the rest of your life? Or if you go to a psychologist, they may well uncover that, uh, that little cat incident. And you'll be working with that psychologist for a couple of years, trying to work out techniques for getting rid of it and trying to work out uh, how uh, you know you can uh, survive without it. And maybe you give you a prescription to, and all these kind of things, but they don't really handle it. And Scientology, poof, it's gone. And uh, um, people like John Athack may have some kind of psychological excuse, but it's really, it does work. I mean, that is the fact of the matter. And that's one of the reasons we all, and, and I got to say, the people that are, were involved with Scientology, I knew they're just, I am amazed how brilliant they are and what they did. Like those people that Mark was talking about, the, the uh, aides to Hubbard, they were like gods to me when, when I was on the ship working deck and stuff. Because these people are doing international management, and a lot of them are very young, and yeah. things that were like way beyond my uh, my. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, that's not my dog. That's not my dog. That's okay. 
I blew cherry on stew. <laughs> All right. So uh, anyway, that was cool. But then, so I did go down to uh, uh, to join the Sea Org, and this is kind of funny because I read uh, nobody recruited me, nobody talked to me about the Sea Org, but the poster said, you know, go to LA uh, to the Advanced Org in Los Angeles. That's where the Sea Org was. Bring a uh, pack a sea bag, and that's it. So I actually have the original sea bag from 1968 that I. Oh wow! <laughs> that's okay to show you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see, uh, I don't know. Can you can you see my name on it there or not? Yeah, S. Moreau, I see it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. I can see it. Okay. So I've hauled this around all these years. I got it at some Army Navy store. Uh, the Army Navy was very uh, was a little thing back then with original Army Navy stuff because there was, you know, the Vietnam War was going on. It wasn't that long after World War II, but um, there was a lot of uh, surplus, they called it Army Navy. We had a couple of one of them in San Francisco. Yeah. It was pretty nice. I remember the one in L.A., all the SEAL members used to go there and get their pea coats. Yeah, there you go. Pea coat. That's yeah. a cool thing. And the, <laughs> and the watch caps and stuff. Oh, there I am. Sea Org guy. <laughs> <laughs> there you are in your Sea Org uniform, right? That's Larry <laughs> Frazier. You know, right there. Remember Larry Frazier? Yes, Larry yes. Yeah. But you know, the badge on your hat is not the standard Sea Org symbol. That's some. Of, that's like a steering wheel. A, uh, a that wheel. might have been because I think I was. I think I got the rank of. I think I made it up to CPO, Chief Petty Officer. Was that a CPO okay. hat? That might have. I don't been. know. Oh, okay. That could have been that. I'm just thinking because I never got ranked in Scientology. I worked my ass off, but I was not in areas to go up the uh, uh, the rankings real quick. I always wanted to, but. I always got because I was in, uh, you know. So you joined the C organization in Los Angeles, right? right you, were, so, you didn't go straight to the Apollo. That no, was no, I rolled up at AO and said I wanted to join the C org, and they looked at me like, "What?" You know, it's like because usually <laughs> I guess most people join because they recruited and talked into it and stuff like that. Well, but, did Captain Bob Young not show up on his mystery ship in San Francisco Bay oh, and was, recruit you from the bar? <laughs> <laughs> that's a cool story. Yeah, I think that's a that's a true one too. No, that was much much later. The Boulevard was was much later. I mean, uh, actually, I got in and um, that would have been um, in uh, late '69. I think I was I was still 19 years old. Hmm. And um, no, we the first place I went to was actually a uh, a base we had in Mexico in Ensenada where uh, uh, they wanted to, somebody got the idea of uh, getting a bunch of students and there was probably about 10 or 15 students and uh, they were going to be trained on, on the standard Dianetics and I, ha I guess I happened to roll up at the right time and I was going to be the course supervisor for that operation. And um, so we did that for a couple of months, I think, actually having to and come, come and go to Mexico. And uh, the only people I remember, there was a class eight guy running that. Well, that's a high level auditor guy. I guess he was on a mission. And uh, we graduated, I think most of the class, it was kind of a cool place to be, but it was very isolated. And um, I only remember, well, um, Paul Preston was on that class and he ended you guys know Paul, he ended yes. up being pretty closely to LRH. Is he still in, yeah, uh, Paul, in the Paul Preston is no, he's not in the SEAL, but he is still a Scientologist. He lives in Ohio and uh, is in good standing. Hi, Paul. But, but just so people know, Paul Preston uh, was a Green Beret. And when right. LRH, when Hubbard went to New York in 1970, December 72, Paul Preston went with him as his bodyguard and with Jim Dinkowski. So yeah, he right. lived with him for nine months in New York. Paul was a pretty tough guy. I remember that. And I was, um, I hope he's okay with me. I, I like Paul. Um, but anyway, we did that for, for a few months probably. And then I guess the lines were pretty loose. So instead of getting reassigned, I actually took a, a leave and went uh, back up to San Francisco. The other person that was, had a girlfriend by that time, who was that person I met at that base. And we went up to San Francisco and uh, hung out there for a little while and went back to L.A. And, you know, I introduced her to my folks and everything. And we did that for a little while then went back to L.A. and hung out with her folks for a while. And, and uh, then I wanted to go back in the Sea Org and she didn't want to. So 
we split up at that point, and uh, that's when I was assigned to the boulevard. Again, pretty good. The boulevard here. There's the boulevard. That was um, there was three ships we had then: the the boulevard and the Ares and the Neptune. I don't. Um, the Neptune was a uh, sub chaser, a wooden hulled sub chaser. Oh, sorry, sorry. The 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 uh, boulevard was a sub chaser. The, the uh, Neptune was a uh, patrol boat, uh, you know, commonly called. Yeah, that's right. Boat. Right. And I, I forget what the other one was, but I wasn't that involved with those uh, right away when I got assigned there. Or soon after that, the ship went into um, into dry dock because it had leaks all around the hull. And there it is. <laughs> and uh, I was put in charge of... Uh, <laughs> We had to put a doubler, a doubler plate all around the waterline, which is just a, a sheet of metal. Uh, it was about three feet wide and probably about 10 feet long each piece. And it was fitted around the hull and welded in place to cover. The waterline was where all the rust was because that's the area that uh, is subject to salt and air a lot. And uh, usually the bottom, the, anyway, I won't get into all the details. But um, I was not any kind of, uh, I mean, I was mechanically inclined. But I was not a welder and stuff. But I, you know, it wasn't that hard. All I was supposed to do was watch them weld. And I did learn about welding and and, uh, but from from that. And um, then we we uh, we went to uh, after that we went out to um, I think somewhere in there they must have got rid of the, the Neptune and the Aries. Uh, yeah. Around and then we were we were uh, anchored in um, San Pedro Bay. And my job was to run the little skiff we had, the little boat. And it was pretty small. It was like a little rowboat, about probably 12 feet by five or six feet. And it had wow. a little, like, you know, you could fit yourself, myself, and maybe two or three people in it. And it was just to run back and forth to shore. And that was my job. And it was kind of fun, but I'd never been in a boat before. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what was it like being in a ship? Like, did you guys, did the boulevard ever go out to sea or were you just, hey, you know, tied up at the dock or well, in the port or what? At first, this was very early on. At first, it was just we were anchored. And soon after that, uh, Bob Young and Jerry McClarty came out on a mission. And their mission was to do the uh, the trial runs and all that. Because the first and only run I ever did on the, on the boulevard was the sea trials was uh, under Bob Young's uh, command. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, where was I on that? Um, okay, so we were at anchor there, and then I had the little uh, the little skiff. And this is a little kind of a story how I first met Pat Broker, actually. And like I said, I didn't really know much about that, but I caught on pretty fast. But the prediction you get by being an expert of things like having uh, spare gas and things like that, I... Uh, I knew exactly how much gas it took to get to shore and I would fill it up in shore. So I do my number of runs and I knew how much gas I had left. And then on the last run, I would fill it up and we didn't have a spare tank. It was just a little gas tank that goes with an outboard motor. It was right. a fun, it was a cool little job for, you know, 90 year old kid and stuff. <laughs> and um, uh, so uh, uh, Jerry McClarty now then came out to the, you know, they were doing this setup mission to to get this thing ready for the sea trials. You know, this was post, this was after the dry dock. They still had stuff to do to get it ready for a sea trial. Of course, I'm not aware of any of this stuff. I'm a, just a new guy on the ship. You know, now I, you know, a whole lot different. But, I mean, I have a lot of training on ships after the Sea Org and stuff. But, um, uh so Jerry comes down. He says, hey, I got to take some pictures, probably for his mission, right, of the boat from the outside. And I said, hey, Jerry, I'm going to run out of gas. He can't do it. And he, of course, he's thinking it's just counterintention because he's this big hard driving sea <laughs> member right, on a mission. And I'm going, no, no, I, I know what I need to get to shore. And he's going, ah, yeah, I'll just make it go right kind of thing. I go, ah, ah. Yeah. well, OK. And so we did a couple of burns around the ship and stuff like that. And uh, then I dropped him off. and. So my next run came up, and of course, halfway there, I run out of gas. And then, halfway to the dock. Huh? Halfway back to the dock. Halfway or halfway to the shore. Yeah, to the, to the shore. You know, you had to go around the yeah. breakwater and then get into the dock there and everything. It was, a, it was a good run. But I'm in the bay there, and there's a freaking good current running in that bay. And I, I think I had oars on board, but there's no way I could get back to the boat. So I'm drifting toward land, like at a pretty good clip. 
and uh, of course they didn't have any walkie-talkie or nothing. And, <laughs> um, well, you know, it's like I said, I, it's not my fault. I was a new guy, okay? That's right. <laughs> 19 <laughs> years old. Huh? Yeah, 19. 19, 19 years so old. I'm going, Shit, I'm, you know, uh, and then somebody must have noticed from the ship, and they had two other, they didn't have any lifeboats on it at the time. They were, our, uh, I guess, yeah, okay. They did add some lifeboat, what they call davits, things to lower the boat. So like hook shaped right. things to swing on, you can lower the boat. And uh, they had two two kind of hulls they were going to make into lifeboats. And they were fiberglass. And uh, so fortunately they had, they were kind of skinny, not much like a canoe skinny, almost a little wider, like maybe this wide or something. But uh, I did notice soon enough that three people were in this little boat coming to rescue me, right? It was Pat Broker and two other people. And Pat got in the boat with me and it was going to be impossible to row that boat back to... Um, because it was bigger and heavier than that little skiff. Oh, there's Pat. Pat is a, a famous uh, figure in Scientology. He was, uh, they know about Pat, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he, he basically took care of Hubbard's security along and lived with him and Annie, his wife Annie at the time with L. Ron Hubbard up until his death. Yeah. Um, how, what was Pat like back then when you when, when you got first from the Sea Org? Well, because I knew Pat, I knew Pat too, but I, I wondered what he was like. Was he a green, was he brand new then too? He, like always, Pat never said too much. I think that's, you know, he's kind of a quiet and, and reserved. And uh, he um, he was pretty, I would say, there as a, as a person, you know. He was, he was focused and knew what he was doing and stuff. But I think uh, one of the things I was going to say a little later on, is, but I'll say it now, is he was probably better dressed than I was. He was kind of a better, he was a good dresser too, right? Wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, he was. He paid attention to he stuff was. like that. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so we ended up on this, uh, this the, the where we ended up. Uh, uh, they rescued you? Well, no, they went back to the boat. There was three people in there. Two of them went back. And me and Pat ended up at, at the back end of this Navy base is where we ended up parking. With oars. The huh? They brought, he brought you out some oars, right? He didn't have gas for I'm you. not sure if I had oars or he just helped me because it was, I couldn't do it by myself. But, but yeah, he brought, there was oars in the boat by the time he got yeah. there. Yeah. But um, I think there was probably oars in the boat. They might have been that much, but it just you couldn't row that. It was kind of heavy because it was wooden and stuff, and you couldn't row against the current and, and way out there. Oh. It's just it was too it was too strong. The little skinny boat and two people could row it. So those two people went back, and me and Pat ended up at the back end of this, you know, the water end of this navy base, and and tied the thing up, and and we decided we had to go get some gas, and uh, so we just walked in and. I was probably, you know, like I said, Pat probably looked a little better than me, but we just walked through the space. The people are giving us funny looks. Like we weren't in any kind of Navy uniforms or nothing. And, uh, and we just walked out the main gate and we got the gas. Getting back in was probably a little bit scarier because they did have armed guards and things like that, but we just nodded at them and they just let us right through. So we ended up, uh, we loaded up the boat and we got back to the ship. Now, of course, uh, when I got back on the ship, the uh, Bob Young uh, <clears throat> read me the riot act. I was going to, uh, I try not to swear these days. So I, I understand. I, I, you know what he tore me. <laughs> but he's, yeah. I'm gonna listen to that. And I said, I said, hey, listen, sorry. Uh, you know, this is really the first time I've ever done anything like this, you know, boats. And I didn't know. And I did tell Jerry that we were going to run out of gas. I knew how much it was going to take. So he kind of softened up a little bit. And I don't think I got in too much trouble for that. But I think uh, um, in the future, uh, a um, walkie-talkie was added to the to the uh, little boat job. Uh, so that was an early experience on there. You know, here's another good Scientology one because I happened to be the boat auditor as well. I was probably the only guy on the on the, uh, on the ship that was a uh, the the the, um, the Boulevard was a good sized uh, ship. It originally was named the Grinnell. And it had a, uh, I think it was used for some kind of diving or something, because it had this big, like, uh, uh, undersea exploration or something, because it had this big rig on the back for, for dropping a bathysphere, I think they're called. But um, <clears throat> it was uh, 175 feet long, I think, something like that, and, and 26 feet wide. And it was, it had huge engines in it. It was designed, one of the, it's, it's like, 
I can go over all this. It's not. It's it's. it's no, it's okay because we're actually get, we're at an hour right now. So I just whatever point you want to stop, we can stop and because okay. we're just scratching the surface with Stuart. Stuart's got a lot. Okay. Oh, yeah. A lot of photos, but this has been really great so far. I mean, I've I've enjoyed every minute of it. It's been cool. great. <laughs> well, my life in from Scientology and before is just a great big adventure, and uh, you know I have no regrets. I enjoyed every every minute of it, and uh, um, well, you know. Oh, that's that's great. <laughs> well, go ahead. Stu, go ahead, I don't have regrets. Everything wasn't all hunky dory, yeah. but I don't have regrets. All yeah, part of God's right. plan. This is my know, life. This is evolving as a big. It's like a big miracle going on. You know, that's the way. And I'm sure you look at it too. You gotta be. You gotta enjoy life. You know. You gotta make the yeah. most out of it. Uh, do I have time for that one more quick story that auditing went on the uh, boulevard? We're we gonna do that later. Yeah, because let's, let's hold it. Yeah, let's, oh. let's hold, we'll hold it on that. Do you want to? Good with that. Oh. What's that? I'm good with that. Sorry. Oh, okay. what did you say? <laughs> I'm sorry, I cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying we're, we're 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 at the end right now, so we'll just save it for the next time. Okay. okay? Yes, sir. Does that sound good, Janice? Okay, so we'll start the next one with the last story of the Boulevard, and then yeah. him getting to the ship, the Apollo. There we go. Right. Okay. That will be the bridge over. That. My really well, anyway, I want to I want to thank you, Stuart, for being here on this channel on, on our first uh, interview with you. We've got more, a lot more to do, lots more photos to get through, but uh, we want to thank you for being here and. Uh, for all of our viewers out there, if you've enjoyed this, please subscribe to our channel. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the uh, like button and uh, hit the notification button. It helps us get uh, our stories out to many more people. And if you have any questions for Stuart or for us, just ask in the comment section down below. Uh, we check them on a routine basis. And uh, if there's any thing that you'd like us to ask Stuart or whatever on the next uh, few videos, just go ahead and ask questions there and we will uh, respond to them. And then finally, if you'd like to support our channel, you can buy us a coffee. There's a link in the description down below. You just click on it and you can buy us one, two, 10, 20, how many ever coffees you want. It's just a way of uh, donating to our channel. And any money we get, we're pretty much putting it back into the channel anyway. So uh, and we appreciate any support that you might have. And that's that. And then also, if you'd like to order, Janice has her book. I don't have the photograph of it about her life on the Apollo. Uh, you go, there's the merchandise down below that's tagged. You can click there and get an autographed copy of Janice's book. And so we just wanted to mention that too. Um, Janice and Stuart, have you got anything else you'd like to say? No, before I'd we like to, sorry, I tend to jump too quick. Uh, thank okay. you. I, I want to say thank you. It's uh, going a lot uh, better than I, I feared. I think you guys are doing a great job in uh, you're very good hosts and uh, thank you very much. Oh, good, thank I you, look Stuart. forward. We appreciate I look it. Forward to the next one. Okay, well, it's going to be fun. That's what we're here just for. Right? Know, so, Stuart, just so you know, we're going to end the recording. I'm going to play a little exit video, but yeah. just stay on because afterwards, after we end, we'll talk after cool. we get done. Okay. Watch it. All right. Well, until the next time, everybody. Bye bye. We'll see you next bye. time. Bye. Bye.